On today's episode of the Procedurally Generated Show, Ethan pretends to be Tony, and Tony tests the strength of his vocabulary. We talk about all of the news from the Nintendo Direct that happened this week, and Brett Weiss joins us to talk about his recent SNES omnibus and his thoughts on gaming history. Well, howdy, howdy, everybody. Welcome to episode two of the Procedurally Generated Show. I'm your host, Tony. Joining me this week, we got Ethan. I am here with a toothache. That can't be very much fun. It is not. I have had those before. They suck big time. I'm on like 19 pills a day, and I'm not on anything nearly as good as that cough syrup. <laughs> That means there won't be any of those funny drugged Ethan moments, is what you're saying. Oh, man, if only. Oh. So, well, all right, it is just going to be the two of this this week. Shannon is out. Uh, he had an emergency come up right before the show, so he is not with us this week. So it'll just be the two of us, Ethan. Well, I guess we'll, we'll make do with what we got. We can handle this. We got this. We got some big news to talk about this week. Yes, we do. So, without any further ado, uh, what game do you want to talk about this week? I want to talk about a little game called Stardew Valley. I've heard of this game. I want to play this game. You should play this game. I say that a lot about this game. I want to play this game, but I never actually play it. It is It's a very Tony-friendly game. I bet it is. It very much reminds me of Old School Harvest Moon, which I am a big fan of. It, it screams Harvest Moon, and I, I, I love every moment of it, including the multiplayer aspect that is included. As a, Yeah, that, uh, that that's going to be my excuse right now, because the multiplayer stuff's not out on console yet. That is the main reason I have not played it before, is because there was no multiplayer. And I wanted to go. stream it, and I wanted to play a game with Jason, so Jason made a uh, game on there, and I joined him, and... Uh, we have Pepperidge Farm. I think that name's been used before. Oh, I'm sure it has, and that's fine, but this is our own little game <laughs> world. There you go. Uh, so, so what are you doing in the game? Our current objective is to get to floor, I guess 100 is the last floor in the mines. So we're working on that. We are definitely farming. Okay. Uh, big surprise there. What's your best crop? We just switched over to summer like two sessions ago of playing. Summer? Yeah, we're in summer. So uh, I think our original best crop was like turnips, possibly. Right now, I don't know what it is. It's all, it's all Jason right now because I've been uh, busy just doing other stuff and uh, losing our money on there since it's a shared cash pool. Okay. Which I, I think that's that's really neat, but it's also kind of a hindrance because we we make the we make money at the end of the day, just like Harvest Moon. It's shared uh -huh. between us, so like if I spend something, Jason knows. And then if one of us wants an upgrade to, let's say, we want one of us wants a larger backpack, we have to go buy that, and then that means if I want, it's, if Jason got the bigger backpack and then I want to get one, then I have to go and buy one as well later on with more money. So it's mm -hmm. it, it, double the funds is going out, we'll say. Yeah. And then same with upgrading your uh, items, such as your scythe, your hoe, pickaxe, axe, th just that sort of stuff. Are you not able to sort of double your output in terms of crops and things like that to, to get well, that money flowing in faster? We could, but you know, one of us is always going down into the mines. The other one's trying to grow crops and then going down into the mines. 
and then you have to be home on there before 2 a.m. or your character just passes out. And mm. you have a chance of losing quite a bit of money in that process, and that's happened a few dozen times now. Do you wake up in, like, the doctor's office? No, you wake up you in your home, out? and there's usually a letter from either of one of the people of the town saying, hey, I found you, and some guys are trying to uh, take your wallet. I don't know how much they took, but you're safe. And the mm. other letter you'll get is, from the people that are taking your wallet saying, hey, we found you passed out. We took care of you. By the way, we took your money. <laughs> and it's the local big company that's trying to put everyone out of business there. Yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, if you pass out while in the... Or no, if you get defeated in the mines and not pass out, uh, you actually lose floor access and random items. And I lost uh, my sword in there. <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah, that was a big deal. Because that was like a sword... That was like the best sword I could have gotten at the time. And we're like in that floor 80-ish area. And... <laughs> so I need to work on getting and... that back. I don't know if I... I, I, or say, I, if I don't think are... I can get the sword back, but... We got we got back to where we were and a little further, but it's still kind of a letdown that my... The sword of all the items that I have can go missing. Yeah, that stinks. They sh there should at least be some way, even if it's a time-based way, for you to get that stuff back. Yeah, like Minecraft, where you, if you die, it's like five minutes, and you can go and find your items before they despawn. Which I can never do. I can never remember where I died and dropped all my stuff in Minecraft. Yeah, that that is a problem. Uh... Other than uh, just, you know, playing that with Jason and streaming it, that's pretty much all all I've done in Stardew Valley. Okay. I, I'm not doing a single-player playthrough on there because I'd, I'd probably be too tempted to, to look up certain uh, aspects to give me a major advantage in the single-player story, I guess. Yeah. It, whereas I'm playing with Jason on there, I... I'm not looking anything up, and it's just, all right, what is my goal today for making money? This? All right, let's do it and call it good. I think that's a pretty good way to do it, though. Oh, it's very nice, whereas if I tried... I, I did actually try to play Harvest Moon, I think, Back to Nature on PS1. And anytime I return to that, I have a guide pulled up, and I'm going to follow that to get like the most optimum route planned and everything. Yeah. But, you know, just going in, doing whatever. That's a lot of fun, especially since I'm playing with a friend on there as, as well. And, and I, I think playing with a friend makes that a little more of an interesting way to play the game um, than just playing by yourself, where you kind of have to min-max your way through it to get the most out of it, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but whereas if you're playing with a friend, you can just sort of goof off and be like, okay, well today we're just going to go do this. And I mean, I guess you could do that in single player. Um, well, it, it's also, we're, we're gaining there. abilities and items that we can, uh, craft independently of each other based mm -hmm. on what we do. Like Jason's gone fishing, so he has a much better, uh, fishing experience and better something with fishing. I don't know. Whereas I went and did a bunch of uh, uh, farm work one day just cutting down trees, and now I have a better ability to use yeah. the axe, even though my axe is still the first axe. Which is kind of cool. And if, if this game ever went to like the, the MMO style of play, where every, there was tons of people all playing at the same time, it would be cool for, for those kinds of things where you have those specialties of people where one person's put a ton of time into farming and so they're really good at farming and this other person, you know, they've spent a lot of time mining ores and making weapons and things like that. So they become sort of just the blacksmith of the town and I think that would be really fun to do. I, th I think the multiplayer can do four people at once without, without yeah. mods, I think up to 16 with mods. So I can see, you know, getting at least four people in there and each person, one person doing nothing but fishing, another one's focused on mining, the other one farming. That leaves the other one to do, I guess, daily tasks on there, mm -hmm. or to help with wh whoever needs something. And 
that could easily work to the advantage of everything until you get to the point where it's like, oh, this person needs the the fisherman needs the new fishing pole, so they're gonna want money for that. Your person in the mine needs a better sword, they're gonna want money for that. And then your person on the farm, it's like, well, they need money and materials so they can build furnace to build this to get this and then they need to upgrade each of their individual items again for, that they use on the farm so it eventually it would catch up to you fairly quickly I, I would believe yeah they'd have to figure out some way to sort of uh keep the the money separate for the different players but it could be interesting to see it would be i think it would be really cool to have a game like that to see how an economy and in a community builds sort of naturally based off of people specializing themselves in specific ways i think world of warcraft did that did that yeah there was studies I've done on like the auction house and like you had the people that did enchanting people that were blacksmiths jewel crafting etc yeah. And so there are studies done on how that economy worked. Well, I might need to go check that stuff out. Nah, you don't need to play that game. No, I've, I have <laughs> I have not played World of Warcraft in a very, very long time. For good reason, so. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, because I was not paying for the game every month. There's no way. Well, you don't have to pay for it now either. It's like free up to a certain level. Well, that's true. I don't know why I'm trying to convince you to play this. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I don't really want to play World of Warcraft. I have a hard enough time playing Final Fantasy 14 on yeah. the PS4. There's there's no way I'm going to play World of Warcraft. Yeah, it surprised me uh, that, that Warcraft isn't on the console. I know, it is. Um, and, like, I played a bunch of Neverwinter. Ooh. Like, a lot for a month. And then it just sort of faded away and I've never gone back to it. So, is Icewind Dell? That's a what? That's Neverwinter, isn't it? It's a D and D property. I don't know if it's in Neverwinter. Hmm. Oh well, I, I I'm familiar with Neverwinter. I just don't know in what aspect I'm familiar with it at now. Yeah, I'm not the right person to ask about that. So, <laughs> um, start asking you about well, like Forgotten Realms and such, and just. Uh, so what have you been playing, Tony? I, uh, well, I'd love to talk about a pretty big RPG that I've been playing on the Switch, but I'm not going to do that till next week. Oh, okay. Um, what I have been playing though is Scribblenauts Mega Pack. Oh. This is it's a double pack of uh, Wii U games. It was Scribblenauts Unlimited and Scribblenauts Unmasked, which is the DC Comics. Right. themed release uh, I haven't touched Unmasked yet uh, if you try to go into that it's like you could play this but there might be some story bits that you'll want to play Unlimited first so I said okay fine I'll go play Unlimited first and I'm probably about halfway through Unlimited at this point point. and the first thing you uh, did was type in the word Batman uh, no I haven't actually I should do that and see what happens um, Probably nothing, even though it's all on the same thing. Yeah, those games don't overlap in any way that I know of. Um, Be cool if they did, I, though. I'm pretty sure there were no licensed characters in Scribblenauts Unlimited. And even uh, they've removed some stuff from the original yeah. Wii U game because the, the Wii U release had Nintendo-specific uh, characters and things in it. And I tried to make Mario in the Switch release, and it wouldn't let me. That's weird. Um, which I thought was strange, but uh, it, it did not let me. Uh, so if you don't know what Scribblenauts is, it is a puzzle game where you're presented with a problem, and then based on the limits of your vocabulary, really... Uh, you can solve that puzzle in any number of ways. So, I mean, it'll be something like there's a cat stuck in a tree and you have to figure out how to get the cat out of the tree. Well, solution is could... always black hole. Uh, I mean, that might work, but I think 
the cat dying in the black hole would actually cause you to lose that, you know, not solve that puzzle. Um, that means you're doing it wrong. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you could look at that in any number of ways. You could grab a ladder and uh, climb the ladder to the top of the tree, pick up the cat, jump down. You could do what I did, and that was chop the tree down, make the cat fall out of the tree. Uh, do what I, I think... do, just type dog and drop it above the tree and let it land in there <laughs> and see what happens. I mean, yeah, you you could do that as well. Drop a dog in the top of the tree, and the cat would get scared and jump out. Uh, you could tie a rope to the cat, pull it out of the tree. Whatever you want to do. I mean, it's up to you. There's As long as you get the cat out of the tree, how you solve the puzzle, completely up to you. Um. And my favorite one, I laughed so much when I did this, and I shouldn't have. It's really kind of mean. Uh, but in the game, I was presented with a scenario where these kids, there were three or four kids, and they were playing baseball, and their baseball went into the yard of this old man. And you're supposed to get the baseball out of the yard. Well, if you just walk into the yard and try to go get the baseball, he gets out of his rocking chair and goes faster than you can do it, and picks up the baseball and won't let you have it. Hmm. You're supposed to figure out a way to get the baseball without touching his yard. So, I mean, you could do something like, you know, spawn in a jetpack and fly over to the baseball. Go Mission Impossible and lower yourself down on a rope overhead. I mean, yeah, you could do that. If you could figure out the way to build the contraption to do the Mission Impossible thing, you probably could do that. My solution was a little bit different. Um, the first thing, the first thing I thought of was you can do, uh, you can add adjectives to items in the game. So uh -oh. you, can, you would just, um, you know, if you have a cat and a girl says, I like, I want this cat to be cuter. You could make it a polka dotted cat or a stripy cat or something like that. Hmm. Uh, you could make huge lollipops, tiny lollipops, whatever you want to do. Uh, what I did was I opened up the notebook, I scrolled through until I found the man and clicked on the add adjective and just made it say blind. So I, I, I blinded the man so that he couldn't see that I was walking into his yard, grabbed the baseball, and walked out. <laughs> You're a horrible person. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how that solution I, or wh why that solution popped into my head, but it totally worked, and I was laughing so much when I solved the puzzle that way. You because I didn't think it was a gonna... old man who was just trying to keep kids off his lawn. I did. And so he's sitting there in his rocking chair and when you make him blind it just puts a pair of sunglasses on him. And so <laughs> he's just an old man with sunglasses you can't see, sitting there wanting the kids to stay off his lawn. Because I thought it wasn't gonna work because it would, you know, as soon as I stepped on the yard, even if he couldn't see it would trigger the the failure and he'd run up and go get the the baseball but i guess because he couldn't see that i was stepping into his yard it let me solve the puzzle that way so <laughs> so <laughs> I, I love so I love we, this if 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 tony's with you people and your baseball goes into someone's yard he's going to blind an old man i that that's obviously the solution to the puzzle uh, so, uh, love it. Um, the game I, I I have always liked Scribble Knots games since the very beginning. I've played them every game that has come out, with the exception of Scribble Knots Showdown. I haven't played that one yet. That came out I think earlier this year on the Switch. Um, I think the only Scribble Knots game I've ever played is that one that came out on iOS a while back. Uh, there have been a couple iOS releases. I liked it. I should probably re-download and play it again sometime. I mean, they're, they're really fun games. Um, it's it's an interesting and, I think, pretty unique style of puzzle game that I hadn't really seen before that time. Um, and they just sort of made it a, you know, a little better with the ability to add adjectives and uh, to see the, the way different things in that game game interacts with each other so you know if you like you said if you have a cat and you put a dog onto the level the dog starts chasing the cat and the cat gets scared and runs away um, i'm sure they've also expanded the game to have different reactions based on how people would 
try to mess with the level since over the years that this, the game series has been out. I'm sure they probably have. Um, I really want to get through this one so I can get back into uh, Unmask because that's the one I didn't play as much as the other ones. Not for any particular reason. It's just one that I, I didn't put as much time into as I would have liked. Because it wasn't Marvel, it was DC. Well, maybe that <laughs> I don't think I don't really think the the name in front of the comic book would have mattered as much. Um, but I will be getting back into that, and that is I am doing that for review, so I'll have a review up on the site sometime soon. Um, so check that out. Uh, but that is it for me. That's that's what I have put most of my time into over the last week with the exception of a game we'll get to a little later in the news so uh, let's take a quick break we will come back and we will talk all about the nintendo direct that happened this week okay so yeah the big news this week was the Nintendo Direct that was supposed to have originally happened, uh, what, 10 days ago, about at this point. I think it was originally scheduled for the 6th. Um, the earthquake happened, and they postponed it. And it did happen on, was it Thursday this week? I believe I think so. It was, I think it was Thursday this week. Um where Nintendo spent 35 minutes talking all about games coming to the 3DS and the Switch. And I'm just going to tell you right now, Ethan, <laughs> this Direct could have been 30 seconds long and I'd have been the happiest man on the planet. I'm sure you would have. 30 seconds was all they needed for me to be very excited about 2019. Uh, because they just started the Direct, the very first announcement before I think even any Nintendo executive came on the screen was the announcement of Luigi's Mansion 3. Woohoo. And that game looks fantastic. Right. It, it, it looks very much like a follow-up to Luigi's Mansion 2. They're keeping that style with that, that look of the ghosts rather than the original Luigi's Mansion, which uh, uh, may be a little bit of a disappointment because I really like the ghost designs from the original GameCube game. I thought they were a little too generic in Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon, and they're sticking with those now, at least the early looks that we've seen of it. We literally have seen about 15 seconds of this game, so there's not a lot to go on. Yeah, there was uh, the first game, seeing the the unique ghosts that were humanoid-ish. Mm -hmm. that, that was great versus, you know, your uh, fodder line of ghosts that you see throughout the game which yeah. is all you encountered in two was the fodder line the entire time. That was annoying. Yeah. Um, the game is set for 2019. No release window yet. They have literally shown 15 seconds of this. My guess is this going to, is going to be a September, October release. Maybe October. It, it makes sense. I think, I think that's the, the perfect time for that game to come out because it is sort of a you know a, a Halloween Halloweeny style themed game that that late September early October release seems like a, a no brainer for that game. Uh, then after that they went into uh, 3DS announcements and there was a few of those. They showed off a little bit more of Luigi's Mansion on the 3DS. Um, the game is coming out on October twelfth and. They showed off a new co-op mode. Yeah. Yeah. So you and a sort of ghosty looking version of Luigi uh, can team up together to go through the mansion. Uh, and they also showed off amiibo support for the game. There's four different amiibo that will be compatible with the game. Uh, Boo is one of them. Uh, if you scan a Boo Amiibo, you'll be able to find the hidden Boos, um, which might actually be a help. I have never found all 50 of the Boos. 49 is the best I've ever done. You're doing it wrong. 
Uh, there's one boo that has always eluded me, and I have not been able to find where he's hiding. Uh, but every run through of that game that I play, 49 boos every time. So, uh, Luigi, uh, I think, is one of the amiibos, but I don't remember if they showed off what he was going to do. Uh, I'm sure Mario Toad, have to do something in Toad. I, I think so. And then Toad, if you scan the Toad amiibo, when Luigi talks to Toad, it will actually refill Luigi's health. Hmm. So, um, the game will be out October 12th for the 3DS. I have said before, I'm not interested at all in picking this game up. Um, and this, di this direct didn't know. I, I actually have no no plans at all to pick this up. Um, I will play it in October, but I'll be playing the GameCube version of the game. Okay, that's fair. So, um, and I don't think we did. We mentioned Luigi's Mansion Three will be a Switch release. Uh, we may not have mentioned that, but that is really good news. And that. That is fantastic news. Uh, because one of these in days, Luigi's Mansion 1 will be on Switch as well. I really hope so. Uh, Luigi's Mansion is is not just a game I play by myself. That is very much a family affair in this house. Um, which is why I'm not really interested in picking up Luigi's Mansion on 3DS. Uh, because you can't crowd seven people around a 3DS to watch the game being played. Um, but having Luigi's Mansion 3 on Switch... I will very much be enjoying that. Uh, let's see. They announced a new a remake of Mario and Luigi Bowser's Inside Story. So that I think, with maybe the exception of Partners in Time, puts every game on the 3DS as actual 3DS releases and not just DS games you can play on the 3DS. Right. Uh, the game will be out on January 11th, and just like the recent Mario and Luigi games, this also includes a, sal a side story, uh, this time starring Bowser Jr. So, the uh, game will be out on January 11th, and I think that just leaves Partners in Time as the only game that hasn't come to the 3DS. Uh, they showed off... The two Yokai Watch, two new Yokai Watch games, Yokai Watch Blasters Red Cat Core and Yokai Blasters White Dog Squad, where you play as the Yokai this time. So, uh, and there will be an update to both of those games that adds the Moon Rabbit crew to them, which will give you new missions and new areas to explore. So. Kind of going the and then, one route there, where it's two different games, but same I game. think the last Yokai Watch release was like that as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so that is that is definitely something they're going to. I think they're going to be doing any with any Yokai Watch games. You'll always be getting those two releases, like they do with Pokemon. And then the last game they showed off. This was a surprise. This came out of nowhere, and. It's kind of a weird pull, I think, for them. And that is uh, Kirby's Extra Epic Yarn will be coming to the 3DS sometime in 2019. A Wii game, right? So this this is a port of a Wii game that came out in 2010, eight years ago. And this game is now coming to the 3DS. Uh, we'll include all of the original game with some new 3DS features. Some new abilities, like the ability to craft bigger yarn balls. Uh, summon the wind that will let you collect beads that you might not be able to reach. And then two new play modes. Uh, no firm release date. And like I said, this, this seems weird to me. Like, this is their, we're not ready to kill the 3DS yet. Look, we've got another game coming to the system in 2019. It's just kind of, why? Exactly. It, it it's it's a weird game to pull, and it's not like a new game. They're just like, okay, we're, we've got this game. It was on the Wii. That means it'll play on the 3DS. Bring it to the 3DS so we can say we're supporting the system. They could have done well. The, it's 2019. Uh, the the other Kirby game that was on Wii, the the Return to Dreamland. Yeah, that because that was like a. I, I mean, I would play that one because I didn't get a Wii copy because. The ridiculous pricing stuff on that one. 
Yeah. And that fits in with the style of games that are already out for Kirby on the, the 3DS. I just think it's weird that they're continuing to support that system still. Um, I realize there are millions of units out there, but the 3DS, I, I think, just needs to... They need to stop at this point. Um, yeah. And maybe that's just me. I know there's a lot of people that still really like the 3DS. I think the 3DS is a fantastic system, but I've moved on personally. I'm not interested in in picking up any of these 3DS games. Uh, I'm ready for them to throw their full support behind the Switch and just put everything on there at this point. Yeah, it would make sense that they would move on, but I can understand if they had these other games in development for so long and it's just the coding's already done and all that, might as well just finish up and release it on there. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, it's going to be easy money for them with these games, but uh, four game announcements for the 3DS and only one new game out of all of them. Mm-hmm. So, uh, But that was it for the 3DS, and then they moved on to uh, some Switch uh, information, uh, and I'm not sure where the best place to start with this is. Uh, they showed off a little bit of Super Mario Party, and that game will be out on October 5th. Uh, it is available if you're interested in pre-purchasing that on the eShop. It's available now, and I think you actually get double gold coins for my Nintendo if you pre-order the game digitally. I have no idea on that one. So, uh, they showed the uh, they showed a brief teaser of the 4.0 release of Splatoon 2. Oh. They showed off some some new weapons, uh, some new stages, and I think some new music as well. Um, but didn't really go into detail as to what that was. They were just like, check out our Tumblr for the Squid Research Lab if you want to find out more information about these things. Um, there's some changes that are going to be happening to Splatfests going forward, uh, where there are different types of battles that you can get involved in that will give you different types of points. I like can get uh, 10 times point bonuses or 100 times point bonuses, where if your team wins, you earn that many extra points for your side in the Splatfest. Um, it's going to make the scoring on that really weird. It is. Um, I'm, I'm very interested. I don't know for sure if this Splatfest that's going on right now is using this updated scoring system because they've got a Splatfest that just started this past weekend or that occurred this past weekend. Um, retro versus modern was the theme of the Splatfest. Um, wonder who's going to win so... over. Wait, that one's already over, isn't it? Uh, it is over by the time people are hearing this, but I have not seen the results yet. So, Good job to the winning side on that, yeah. whoever you may be. So, I'm going to say good job, Team Retro. That's the team I joined. So I joined no uh, team as I don't have that game. <laughs> I actually played quite a bit of that over the weekend with um, Shelby and Shannon. Uh, we played we got in and finally were able to do some salmon run and played for probably three or three and a half hours one night. Nice. So um, it definitely got me like, I want to play more Splatoon now. So um, I might be playing a little bit of Splatoon over the next week. Uh, let's see. The, they have gone to version 2.0 for Mario Tennis Aces. There's a free update available for that game, or will be available on the 19th. Uh, a new co-op mode that lets you participate in different missions with uh, other players. Uh, some new characters. Uh, Birdo is now playable. Shy Guy, Koopa Paratroopa, and Petey Piranha are all playable characters now. Shy Guy for the win. Uh, I'm saying Koopa Paratroopa. That'd be my that'd be my boy in that. <laughs> so, I don't have Mario Tennis Aces, so I'm I don't really 
you know, care. But <laughs> I don't have it either. <laughs> that's who I pick. Um, Diablo three now has a release date. Yes. Uh, that is November second. And it will include the uh, uh, was that the necromancer? Yeah, this includes everything. This is this is the like super release of Diablo three, and we'll also have amiibo support. Think amiibo support, uh, where you can uh, get Ganondorf. Uh, Ganondorf as cosmetic armor in the game. Yeah. So that's cool. Uh, yeah, I'm very interested in, in playing Diablo 3. I haven't played it yet. I honestly didn't understand what they were saying when they were showing off the uh, Amiibo support on there. I didn't, I was like, okay, so you got that character there. And then it said Ganondorf out. I was like, oh, that's what they were showing. Yeah. Yeah, they were showing It was like Ganondorf. way over my head for no reason at all there. Uh, oh they showed God. off a little bit more of Starlink Battle for Atlas, the Star Fox exclusive stuff in that game. The game will be out on October 16th. I'm, I'm um, starting to believe that game is just a Star Fox game. At least on Switch it is, um, because the Xbox and the PlayStation won't have that. It is coming to those systems, um, but there is a they're put they're focusing all of their marketing for that game on the Star Fox exclusive stuff for the Switch version of that game. So weird. The only time I ever hear about it's from Nintendo and it's always Star Fox related. And it looks really good. Yeah, it looks great. Like, it looks really good. The only thing that I'm sort of down on, not really down on, but think could hurt the game is this whole, it's bringing the toys to life stuff back. Uh. Uh, so... You know, if you want to switch out weapons and things, you got to have the the toy parts for those to put onto your ship. Um, but the game itself looks really good. I am very interested in playing Starlink from Ubisoft. Uh, let's see. They showed off a little bit more of The World Ends With You, final remix from Square Enix, and I think it got a release date. Um, that'll be October 12th. I don't yes. know if the... I don't know if the release date had been mentioned before that. Um, but that will be out for the Switch on October 12th. And then they also showed off a little bit of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Torn of the Golden Country. Which is an expansion to Xenoblade Chronicles 2, but you do not have to have Xenoblade Chronicles 2 to play it. It is a standalone, separate release. Uh, I think it's 40 bucks, and it's getting a physical version as well. So... Um, you'll be able to pick that up through the eShop for 40 bucks. If you bought the expansion pass for the original Xenoblade Chronicles 2, you get it for free. I think you can get it right now if you have that expansion pass. Uh, I think so, yeah. I think uh, it is out September 21st in stores and on the eShop, and it is currently available if you bought the expan the season pass for Xenoblade Chronicles 2. All right. So, and that is like a separate game all to itself. It takes place, I think, 500 years before the events of Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Uh, they showed off a little bit of NBA 2K19 as well as NBA 2K Playgrounds 2, which for anybody that doesn't know, NBA 2K Playgrounds 2 is NBA Playgrounds 2, but 2K is publishing the game, so they put their stamp on it. Makes sense. Um, Too many twos in that title, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Just Dance 2019. Showed off a little bit of that. That'll be out on October 23rd. FIFA 19 on the 28th. Sonic Team Racing uh, will be out this winter. They still don't have a release date for that. And then LEGO DC Super Villains will be out on October 16th. Uh, let's see. They showed off. They showed off more information about the online service, Nintendo Switch Online, which uh, launches on the 18th. We knew every single thing they showed off in that presentation. They didn't show anything new, right? Uh, aside from some of the other NES games that will be available. 
Uh, and I could pull up uh, the full lists of NES games, but it would take me a minute. Um, but as far as the the service itself, 20 bucks a year for online play, voice chat through the app, which will include Mario Kart 8, Mario Tennis Aces. I think it's all first-party games that are going to be using that. Um, I have the list of launch titles. Okay. Do you want to go ahead and say what those are? We have Soccer, Tennis, sure. Donkey Kong, Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers. Wait, 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 wait. Mar wait. Mario Brothers as yeah. in the Atari... No, as in the arcade game. Okay. Uh, Balloon Fight, Ice Climber, Dr. Mario, The Legend of Zelda, Super Mario Bros. 3, Double Dragon, River City Ransom, Ghost and Goblins, Tecmo Bowl, Gradius, Pro Wrestling, Ex <clears throat> Excite Bike, Yoshi, Ice hockey and baseball. Okay, it's a decent list of games. And then in October, we're going to get Solomon's Key, NES Open Tournament Golf, and Super Dodgeball. November will bring Metroid, Mighty Bomb Jack, and Twin B. And December will bring Wario's Woods. Ninja Gaiden, and Adventures of Lolo? Oh, man, I love that game. I've never heard of that game. You've never heard of that's a That's a HAL joint. Um, <laughs> it's a fun little single-screen puzzle game. You should check that out, because that game is really fun. Oh, okay, I know what this is. It's like Kirby before Kirby was around. Yeah, and... I've seen it before. I didn't. I wasn't familiar with the name. No. Uh, so they showed that off. They talked about cloud saves and just mentioned that you would be able to save uh, to the cloud if you are a subscriber. Um, one thing that was that did sort of come out after the event was that if you let your online subscription lapse. Those cloud saves could disappear. Yeah. So keep that in mind if you are using those cloud saves. If you let your subscription lapse, you may lose those cloud saves in the future. Cloud save won't be much of a cloud save if it's deleted. It's true. That is true. Uh, there's also something about for these NES games, your system is going to have to ping their server once a week to check, I guess, to see that you're still a subscriber to the service to be able to play those NES games. So if you did it so, just right, you could probably get an extra week on the end there. Possibly. Uh, and then they also showed off a set of controllers that will be exclusive to online subscribers uh, that are wireless NES controllers that connect to the switch and you can actually uh to charge them you connect them to the to the system the same way you do the joy cons there's a left and a right controller still there are and they they're very specific the about which really. ones are which uh just so, there there is a, fa a famicom controller style as well right uh, is that exclusive to Japan though, or can they well, can most we get those here? Okay. I, I don't see a reason why they wouldn't work over here, but yeah, I mean, if you could get a set somehow, then I'm sure they should work. They'll pop up online. On I'm sure they will. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and they'll be very expensive too. Oh yeah, yep. Uh, let's see. So yeah, still no real new information about Nintendo Switch Online. Uh, they did say Nintendo Switch Online subscribers would get special deals, but they were like, we'll tell you about those in the future. So, they did not go into what those deals would be. 
Uh, they showed off a little bit more of Yoshi's Crafted World, which will be out in the spring. Uh, that game looks really fun. It looks very much like a Yoshi's Island style game. Yeah, it looked really only, good. Only set in cardboard. a world made out of cardboard. So, uh, showed off a bundle for Super Smash Brothers Ultimate that includes a Smash Brothers branded dock, as well as Joy-Con controllers. And I, I like the Joy-Con controller thing. I think I mentioned as soon as they did it because it's it's a set of gray Joy Cons with the Smash logo basically embossed onto them so the left joy-con has the vertical line in the smash brothers logo as well as part of the horizontal line and then the right joy-con is just has that last little bit of the horizontal line so basically they had a set of joy cons on the screen they just flashed that smash brothers logo onto it and said here you go here's a set of joy cons for this yeah uh the bundle will launch for 359 will include a download code for the game as well as the Joy Cons and the dock. Uh, I think those will that bundle will actually be out before the launch of the game. Yeah, on November second, but the code will not be able to be redeemed until December seventh when the game actually launches. Makes sense. So yeah, I mean it does. Uh, but you will have, you know you will have a copy of the game as soon as it is available. Uh, they confirmed that New Super Mario Bros. U is coming to the Switch, and it is still called New Super Mario Bros. U, only they added the word deluxe to the end of the title. For good reason. So, a uh, four-player game just like the original. You can play as Mario, Luigi, Nabbit, Yellow Toad, it looked like. It looked like Blue Toad was gone. Like, he's not around anymore. Mm -hmm. So you just have a la gold, no buck and berry. Uh, but Toadette is now a playable character. That's cool. And she transforms into Peach. Peachette. Peachette, that is true. Uh, there's a new power-up in the game called the Super Crown for her. If you get that, Toadette transforms into Peachette. So she turns into Peach, but Peach has pigtails. Uh, she can double jump. She has Peach's floaty move. And also, if she falls into a pit, she actually will jump out of the pit. So you have a chance to save yourself from dying. She's overpowered. A uh, little bit. Um, Navit will not get hurt by enemies. So uh, I think Navit was playable in New Super or in Super Luigi U. Yes, he was. Which which is also included in this bundle. So you get New Super Mario Brothers and Super Luigi Brothers together, or New Super Luigi U together in one package, uh, which they were doing on the Wii U at the end. So It's a um, lot of content for that game. There is. Uh, and I'm actually pretty interested in picking this one up again and playing through it. Um, some of the content from the original is obviously not going to be in there because there was gamepad specific stuff that you could do um, on the Wii U, which you can't do because you don't have dual screens on the Switch. Right. Uh, game Freak showed off a new game that they're working on that is currently called Town. It is a working title. That is obviously not going to be the, the the name of the game. I mean, it could be, but right now it is just being called Town, which looks like a new RPG from that developer. Yeah, um, it was the a entire. Little... Mm. Go ahead. No, that's fine. I was say the entire game takes place inside of a single village. I'm very interested in seeing how they're going to do this and pull this off, if that's the only location in the game. I'm not sure. Um, so we shall see. Uh, they showed off a little bit more of Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu, Let's Go Eevee. You will be able to change your character, your Eevee or Pokemon's hairstyle by touching the game. Pet the by petting them. Switch. <laughs> yes. Uh, you also have these super moves that you can do by chopping down trees, traveling across water, soaring through air. I think those were 
HMs in the previous games? Uh, they... This one seems like these are specific moves for the creatures that are not by the the HM names this time. Okay. Okay. But like Surf is still Surf. So. Yeah. Uh, so then they showed off the the new Switch that has been shown off for that where you have uh, Pikachu Joy-Con and Eevee Joy-Con um, for that. That 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 switch looks really nice too, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Katamari Damacy is coming to the Switch. Yeah, it is. In Katamari Damacy Reroll, which is a remake of the original Katamari Damacy game, which was a PS1 game, right? E- PS2. PS2. Or okay. Was it PS2 or GameCube? I I've never played Katamari before, so I don't know. It was on one of those first. Um. It will be out in the eShop on November 30th, and then a retail physical version will come later in the year. Uh, We'll have uh, gyro controls and multiplayer support. So you'll be able to roll, roll that Katamari around using tilt controls, should you wish. (laughs) Uh, Why would you even want to do that? I don't know. Some people like tilt controls. I uh, showed off a little bit more of a game that you're really interested in, Demon X Machina. Yes. Uh, which looks is like a, a uh, mech style game. Looks similar to like uh, Armored Core, but I don't know, more, I guess, anime ish would be the correct term on there. Yeah, it's very anime, cell shaded style visually. So yeah, that should be a lot of fun when it comes out, being able to get parts from other mechs and then building your own custom looking mech from those parts. Mm-hmm. Hey, yeah, this game was originally announced, I think, at E3 this year, and they showed off a very brief trailer of the game at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll be out sometime in 2019. They have not announced a firm release date for that. Uh, Capcom has this week a game coming out, the Capcom Beat'em Up Bundle, which is a bundle of, I think, seven of their classic arcade beat'em ups, Final Fight, Captain Commando, Knights of the Round, uh, Armored Warriors, Battle Circuits. Those are the only ones that are mentioned in the press release, but I swear there are a couple more that they didn't, showed off. Didn't even recognize half of those you said. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, if you like side-scrolling beat-em-ups from Capcom, that game's going to be out this weekend. I think it's going to be 20 bucks, so it's a pretty good price for somewhere between 5 and 7 old arcade-style beat-em-ups. Uh, City Skylines came out this week on the Switch with all of the previously included DLC. Um, so if you are into city-building, you know, Sim city style games, you can check that game out. And then I think we talked about this last week, uh, but it was shown off during the direct this week that Civ 6 will be coming to the Switch on November 16th. And I want to say this is a console exclusive on the Switch. Don't Mm, quote me on that, but I thought I saw somebody say that it was coming to Switch and PC. I'm going to look that up. Okay. You look that up. Uh, Mega Man 11. Uh, they showed off a little bit of that. Uh, and the new Mega Man 11 Amiibo. So Mega Man is getting a new Amiibo with the release of this game on October 2nd. Uh, the demo is out now. If you want to try it out, it's one level. You fight against Blockman. Uh, and you get to try out a couple of the special weapons in the game as well. As as well as the new gear system and the, the the double gear system. So and that game is hard, I'll tell you. Playing that on normal, it took me two and a half or three hours to beat that that one level. Um so it is very it feels mostly like an old school Mega Man game with a fresh coat of paint on top of it. There are a few things uh, about it that, that felt sort of off 
for people who have played a lot of Mega Man in the past, but I think it's going to be a, a pretty decent game when it comes out. Okay, it looks like uh, Civ 6. It, uh, Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS, and Nintendo Switch. There you go. It is a console exclusive on the Switch. Yep. Um, Asmodee Digital showed off some electronic versions of popular board games. Carcassonne, uh, the Lord of the Rings uh, living card game, a dungeon crawler based on Munchkin, which is a card oh, yeah. game from Steve Jackson. Yeah, it's a games. fun card game. Uh, and then Catan will be coming to the Switch as well. Cool. So, uh, and then I'm trying to hold off on the last couple of big announcements here. Uh, Square Enix has jumped all in on the Switch. They basically brought the entire Final Fantasy line from seven on, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, they yeah. showed they announced that HD versions of Final Fantasy VII, which I believe this is the PC release that is also the... out on PS4. Yes. Um, so this is not the remastered version, so... <laughs> don't get your hopes don't... up. No. Uh, that game's not going to come out for another 15 years, I think. So um, don't, don't get... This is just the, the HD version that was out on PC and PlayStation 4. Isn't the... Amazon pre-order still saying December this year. Yeah, that ain't happening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy IX, Final Fantasy X, and X2 HD Remaster. So those uh, PS4, I think PS4 and Vita releases are it was coming also, to the uh, PS3 as well. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. Because I then had to buy Final... it all three times. <laughs> Final Fantasy twelve, the Zodiac Age. Four, if you count the PS2 version. Uh, eight, not included in this. Yeah, that is weird. I cannot Which, understand that. You and I have been talking about this since the direct happened, trying to find out what's going on because eight hasn't been re-released. I think there was a PC release the year after it came out to PS2, or was it a PS1 game? It is a PS1 game. PS1 game. Yeah, because the PS1 Classic came out on PS4. It's also on PC. But that game hasn't been re-released since those times. Um, not like 7 has been done a bunch. 10 oh. and 10 2 obviously got redone. I bought uh, what the PC is it about... version back in 2015. What is it about 8? that Do they not like 8? Is there a licensing issue with 8? I can't figure out why 8's not a part of this. I will never know unless I can get some someone from Square to just tell me, hey, this is why. Yeah. Uh, and then no Final Fantasy 13, 13, 2, or 13, 3. That's fine. So don't the Lightning those. Trilogy can will not be on Switch. Yeah, you don't need that. Hey, man, if you like 20-hour walks down hallways, you need to be playing Final Fantasy 13. I don't. <laughs> uh, so that's 7, 9, 10, 10, 2, 12. Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles, which they oh, yeah. had shown off. They had mentioned in a press release after the original delayed um, Nintendo Direct. Uh, World of Final Fantasy Maxima will be out on November 6th. But you can play as Lightning in that. Uh, you can. You're right. <laughs> Uh, she and found then a way. Final Fantasy, not Final Fantasy. Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon. Everybody, I want to play this game. Chocobo, the Chocobo games are always adorable looking. Uh, and then uh, the the last one, Final Fantasy Fifteen Pocket Edition HD, which I think was originally supposed to be out the day of the previous direct yeah. um, because that game just sort of showed up on uh, PS4 and Xbox One that day or the next day 
Um, I think it was supposed to have been out on Switch and been, you know, sort of a 24-hour exclusive type thing for them. Um, but I downloaded that game almost immediately after the Direct, and I've put probably three hours into it so far. Um, but this is this is a console port of a mobile port of a console game. Yes. So this is the iOS and Android version. Redone a little bit to use proper button controls. Uh, I think the battle system is modified from Final Fantasy 15. It has a lot of the stuff in Final Fantasy 15 based on what I played from the demos. So like the warp attacks and character combos and things like that. It feels very much like Final Fantasy 15, just a sort of trimmed down version. Do you still get to drive the vehicle around? You do. Do you have to worry about gas? No. Uh, you're not playing it right. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, like, if you're the not games... worrying about fuel, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you know, the game starts out with the, with them being out of gas and you having to push the, the car down the highway. Okay, that's fair. Um, that's kind of what happened in the first of the original. So, I mean, it's got all of the original voice acting. It's got a lot of the cutscenes are pulled straight from Final Fantasy 15. They've just been redone in this chibi art style that they've got. Um, and so I've been playing that. I'll talk about that as my game highlight, I think, next week. Um, but I am digging it so far. Like, if, if this is as good as I think it's going to be all the way through, this is a really good way to play this game. Um, like, I don't have a lot of time to play a ton of RPGs. I love JRPGs, but they're so long. You know, when you have to commit 40, 50, 60, 100 hours for a game, um, and they've pared this down to a 10-hour release of Final Fantasy 15 that gives you basically the full story. Yeah, so. yeah I guess. So, but let's see. That's 7, 9, 10, 10 to 12... Chocobo 15, World of Final Fantasy, and Crystal Chronicles. That's eight Final Fantasy games that are coming out in the next year on the Switch. Again, eight either eight is showing up in a different way on here. So we don't get number <laughs> eight, but there's eight games. Uh, so yeah, and all of these, with the exception of Final Fantasy 15, which is out now, these are all 2019 releases. Um, well... That's not entirely true, because World of Final Fantasy will be out in November. Hmm. Uh, but all the rest of them will be out in 2019. Uh, and then last, they showed off... Uh, and I wish Shannon was here for this, because he had the <laughs> best reaction to this. Uh, they did their whole, oh, thanks for watching the Direct, but hold on, we got one more thing to talk about. Yeah. And Isabel came on the screen. And I thought, oh, hey, we're going to get an Animal Crossing game. And it wasn't an Animal Crossing announcement. No, it was a announcement for Isabel in Smash. Yes, Isabel is a playable character. She is not an Echo Fighter. She is a full-on playable character in Smash Brothers. Uh, so they showed off a little bit of uh, what she'll be able to do in that game. She looks adorable, by the way. <laughs> every, she will win every fight because no one will want to punch her in the face. Um, she'll just stand there looking like a cute little dog, and everybody else will fight each other, and she'll win by default. Um, I think that's how every Isabel fight will actually happen. Uh, it's going to make then, you, though, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but then immediately after that, Tom Nook came on the screen. Um, it looked like he was sort of watching the direct. I think is what they were kind of going for. And then it ended, and he turned on his light, and he's like, "I guess I should get some place ready for all these guys to come back to when Once they're, they're done. done with Smash and camp." Yep. And that's how they announced Animal Crossing for the Switch. 2019 
it was both incredibly well done i think it was a perfect way to do it but it got a lot of people mad for a few seconds i think oh uh, yeah it was shannon was belligerent for a moment <laughs> <laughs> it was it, it was incredibly frustrating for a little bit but they did it so well it was the perfect way to announce animal crossing for the switch um and i'm assuming that those visuals for that little video they did with isabel and tom nook that's sort of what that game is going to look like yeah that looked really well done uh, it did it did absolutely uh, i don't know when 2019 this will be out if this will be a holiday thing if they'll put this out early in the year um so they're just saying 2019 right now they're not talking about it so uh but that is that was the direct i mean it was a an, i think it was a very very good direct uh, there's a lot of stuff coming out in the next few months a lot of really nice stuff coming in 2019 uh, for the system i think they did a really good job of putting this stuff out with the exception of switch online I, I, we still don't really know what our 20 or 35 dollars if you get a family plan is going to get you aside from some nes games and the ability to play games online that we've already been able to do all right, and joining us now, we've got author and gaming historian, Brett Weiss. How are you doing, sir? Hey, great. How are you guys? Good. Doing fantastic. Good deal. All right, Ethan, I'm going to try to let you get a word in edgewise this week, okay? All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Brett uh, is a, a friend of the show. He's We've met him a few times over the years at uh, various gaming conventions, and he has a book that has recently come out, the SNES Omnibus Volume 1. Um, Brett, you want to tell people a little bit about that book and exactly what it is? Yeah, it's the SNES Omnibus, the Super Nintendo and its games, Volume 1, A through M. And so it's a every single U.S. release uh, from A through M is in the book. Every game has a substantial write-up by myself. Uh, so I wrote a description for each game. And also a bunch of people in the industry, YouTubers, programmers, video game convention organizers, video game store owners, uh, video game reviewers who write for magazines, people like that have stories in the book about growing up playing Super Nintendo games, uh, different stories about uh, things that happened to them, uh, playing like, you know, all night uh, multiplayer sessions with friends, you know, when you're trash talking. Uh, some people have stories about maybe a game that helped them get through a rough time, like the death of a relative. Uh, there's really serious stories. There's funny stories. Uh, some of the contributors are people like John Riggs, YouTuber, uh, Brittany Brombecker, oh. uh, Christopher, the old-ass retro gamer, Pico, Eric, 8-Bit Eric Perez, Sean Long, people like that. And then you've got authors like Kurt Collada, Tim Lapatina, who wrote Art of Atari, Blake J. Harris of Console Wars. And then you got some... Uh, programmers, uh, you know, just just a bunch of different um, industry people contributed stories. You know, what what was it like going to Blockbuster in the nineties and renting games, and uh, what impact did that have on you? You know, what was it like shopping at Toys R Us and you know going through the bargain bins and all that kind of stuff? So it's just, you just get a good variety of stories that supplement the you know just typical reviews and write ups and things. So. You've got, and it's a big hardcover coffee table book with uh, every game has the box scan, the cartridge photo, screenshots, and there's also a lot of vintage uh, ads from old magazines. So you've got a, there's over 2,000 photos and uh, a lot of color, a lot of insight. There's a lot of quotes from old magazines. There's a lot of nostalgia in the book and a lot of uh, historical information so if you're a super nintendo fan it's it's very comprehensive and something you'd you'd definitely want to check out uh a through m uh volume two which will complete the set will be out in spring of 2019 and it's n through z it'll be a little bigger because of the, all the super titles like super yeah. metroid super star wars etc cetera, etc cetera. but it'll be the same price 50 bucks it's a big uh book with a big it's got a dust jacket and uh you know glossy pages and all that good stuff. It's uh, published by Schiffer, a professional publisher. 
Uh, it's not self-published, so it's uh, a good bookstore quality book. And this this really is a, a fantastic book. If you're interested at all in the history of games, and this is every title that was ever released for that system. Uh, and it's not it's not just like a paragraph here or a paragraph there. Every game has its own full page dedicated to it. Yeah, I wanted I wanted every game to get a full spotlight, and um, so yeah, every. As a matter of fact, when I initially uh, contacted Schiffer, the publisher of the book, um, about it, uh, I had envisioned one volume, and every game would get a half a page, and then um, some of the more popular games might get a full page, you know, like Donkey Kong Country, Legend of Zelda, Link to the Past, things like that. But the publisher, the the head of the company, actually called me, and we ended up talking for about 45 minutes about uh, the vision for the book and what he had in mind, what I had in mind. And he actually uh, suggested the idea of doing a two-volume set because mm -hmm. he thought it would be better for each game to get a full page. That would separate it from similar works, and that would get, you know, you could have more screenshots that way, more information, more nostalgia. And so I thought about it for about a day, and I, I really liked the idea. Now, you run the risk of people that, well, I don't want to buy two volumes. But I, you know, I'll just get something else, or I won't get it, or whatever. But I think uh, anybody that you can go on Amazon and get, get a really good look. If you just go to Amazon and put in the SNES Omnibus, and then you click on the cover of the book, you can look at some sample pages, and I think you'll get a good idea of, of what the book is like and and how much you know every game gets gets a good a good write up and you know plenty of information and photos. So uh, so I think we made the right decision by dividing it, dividing it into two volumes. Yeah, um, it's. It, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be two volumes. I mean, the Super Nintendo had such a huge library that uh, it, I think it would be impossible to really do the, a lot of those games justice if they only had half a page, considering how much information you've got in the book. Yeah, the more I thought about it, I didn't want each game just to have a single paragraph, and I didn't want you know any games to get you know cut short. And, uh, you know, I didn't want it just to be bare bones information that you could find online. I wanted a lot of, uh, you know, to, to do the research. I went to each game, to each manual, to each, you know, full play on YouTube, you know, whatever I could find to get as much accurate information as possible. Because a lot of these games, if you look, let's, I'm not going to mention any websites in particular except for Wikipedia, but regardless of the website, there's, there's some really respected websites online, gaming websites that nevertheless have inaccurate information. Mm -hmm. As I uh, went through and researched this book, I mean, I would I would be playing a game and I would watch the end credits or I would look on YouTube. If I couldn't get to the last level or, or it was a rare game or whatever, I would watch the end credits on YouTube and it would clearly say, you know, published by, developed by. Well, then you would look at a website yeah. and it would have the wrong information. I said, well, all you had to do was, you know, do the, the legwork. So I did a lot of investigative work, um, you know, looking at the actual manuals, uh, uh, you know, just getting the accurate information. And so uh, that's real important to me, you know, not only just have a colorful, fun book to read, but also to be historically accurate, you know, for, uh, you know, just for research purposes and for, uh, you know, just for historical documentation and that kind of thing. Yeah. And, you know, Ethan, speaking of people that, uh, contributed to that book. We actually know someone here on this show that has a contribution inside the book. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, the uh, Kirby Superstar. I, I contributed for that part on there. Oh, okay. Okay, it's all coming together now. You're like, oh, you're that, Ethan. Ugh. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, I probably should have helped contribute for the second volume, but I think I, my original choice on that was i'm gonna let him have space for other people on there <laughs> well i'm hoping um you know if, if if volume one so far so good volume one is selling well and um, i'm i'm and I've, I've talked to a lot of people that want, that are a lot of people are excited about volume two because of all the super titles and um as a matter of fact i've talked to some people that are only going to buy the volume two because all their favorite games are, are in the latter half of the alphabet and um mm -hmm. anyway so if, if if the publisher's happy with the sales, um, more than likely I'll, I'll uh, um, approach him with a possible Sega Genesis on. Oh yes, so, nice. So, 
yeah ho- hopefully i can do that but it'll have to you know i would love to do it just for fun or as a labor of love or whatever but it'll you know i'll, I'll need it'll need to be financially viable too you know just for my time and because i've got you know the, a wife and a house and all that stuff <laughs> it needs to be you know it needs to be lucrative so hopefully uh SNES Omnibus 1 and 2 will sell well enough where I can uh, do a Genesis one. That's one I would read just because I don't, I, I'm not very familiar with the Genesis library itself. I was a Nintendo guy growing up. I didn't own a Genesis ever. I still have never owned a Genesis. So a lot of those games, I've never gotten a chance to play. Well, it's interesting when I was soliciting stories for the book from different, you know, from industry people, a lot of people had the opposite they were like well i was a sega genesis kid growing up and i really don't have much uh you know experience with the super nintendo so i'll have to pass and i was really surprised how many people said you know they were didn't have much super nintendo experience so you know just a fluke you know it could be just a coincidence of who i asked you know that kind of thing yeah but uh it is a lot of people divided along those you know they were either either super nintendo or sega genesis and you know, f- fanatics like myself had both. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't till so, I had my own money and wasn't relying on my parents to buy video game systems that I was able to get multiple consoles. Yeah, well, part of it's age, you know, because by the time the Sega Genesis came out, I mean, I was 22, and then the say Super Nintendo comes out in '91, I was 23, so working and all that stuff, and still living at home too. So I had plenty of extra money, and so. uh because my parents are so chill and just so cool and easy going and everything that I was in no huge hurry to move out, you know, after I graduated. And so it was pretty easy to, to have some extra consoles and things since I was living at home and still working and, or, you know, still living at home and, and working and everything. So I did have that luxury, you know, of have, having multiple consoles and all that. Mm-hmm. So if you yeah. do get around to doing the Sega Omnibus or Genesis or whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it, um, yeah. just going to say this right now, dibs on Sonic 3. <laughs> oh, you got it. <laughs> well, imagine Sonic. All the Sonic games will have uh, at least Sonic one through three. Will have multiple write ups. I'm sure, so awesome. that shouldn't be any problem. Yeah. I mean, uh, you're obviously very interested in gaming history. How important do you think it is to have books like this to to keep that history alive? Well, um, you you know, people. It's it kills me when somebody says, well, what do you need books for? You've got the internet. To me, it's, it's a very different thing. For starters, yeah. websites aren't necessarily going to last forever. I mean, the All Game Guide was a, a, a website I worked on during, I started writing for the All Game Guide in 1997. And, I mean, that was before retro gaming was really being, you know, a huge, a huge industry like it is now. People were, weren't really paying a whole lot of attention to earlier consoles in the 90s. And, you know, I was writing for this website, so it was kind of cool, you know, to be kind of on the cutting edge of, I mean, there were some magazines and fanzines in the 90s that were focusing on older stuff, but it wasn't like it is now, where just retro gaming is huge. So it was it was pretty cool to be kind of on the forefront of of writing about retro games and kind of before that was super mainstream and everything. But anyway, so the All Game Guide, their mission was to uh, describe and review every game for every console. So I'm working on Atari, Odyssey 2, and all this stuff. Well, in the early early 2000s that website went away so all that's gone and you know that could happen that was a massive uh website that was tied in with the all music guide and some other you know big webs it, it was a major thing you know they sold their content to blockbuster and ebay and all this stuff and uh it's gone so books have a permanence and professionally published books in particular have a sophistication and a quality that it's real hard to find online since you know, so many websites are crowdsourced or um, yeah. are just, un, you know, they're not written by professional writers, whereas uh, professionally published books, uh, t- you know, just tend by their nature tend to, to have more, you know, better writing and more quality and uh, all that good stuff. So so I think books are very important to, to preserve that history because you get it, you get the permanence and the, and the quality that you're not always going to find online. Well, I, I think there's also just nothing like the feel of an actual book in your hands. And, you know, scrolling through a website, you may not be as interested in just, you know, randomly finding something in the book. You know, if you're just flipping through the pages, looking at the screenshots, maybe a couple of little things, you might see something that catches your eye and you read something about a game that you had never known about before. And I don't think you get that sort of 
um, sense from from websites that you do from having a book in your hand. Yeah, and, and books can have a, a linear or non sensation depending on how you want to just you know if you just want to read it page by page or if you just want to flip through. Sometimes books it's just a different experience going through a physical book. Yeah. I, I think the biggest debate right now going on, I think, in you know gaming history circles is the talk of emulation. Um, there's a lot of people that are either for it, a lot of people that are against it. You don't really seem to have a lot of people in the middle. What are your thoughts on emulation as a whole, in a, as a way to preserve history? Well, I think uh, I, I'm fine with it. I mean, a lot of this stuff is getting expensive to own firsthand, and a lot of these are, you know, getting lost in time. So, as a matter of fact, it's interesting that you mentioned that because in the back of the SNES on on the bus, uh, there's a couple of supplementary uh, articles in the back. There's one on the console war about Russell Demaria, who used to write all those uh, strategy guides for different Super Nintendo games. And then there's also a really, really uh, authoritative and in-depth chapter on uh, emulation. And it's by a guy named Alex McCumbers, and it's called Emulating the Super Nintendo History, Legality, and Its Value to the Gaming World. And he does a really good, thorough, articulate job of the value of emulation, why it's uh, important, and and why it uh, you know has has worth and is uh, a legitimate uh, you know thing to pursue in gaming. So mm-hmm. I would refer to people to that. It's it's uh, it, it 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 makes a really convincing convincing argument that it's uh, beneficial to the game industry and not inherently. Just depending on what you're emulating, yeah. And a lot of the companies are, you know, doing their own, own emulations with, you know, these plug and plays and stuff. So it's true. You know, it preserves it pre- in in some ways. It preserves the past. You know, a, a relatively small people, small group of people want to, you know, scour eBay or website or, or garage sales or whatever, looking for original equipment to hook it up to a CRT. You know, there's just very few. You know civilians are going to want to do that just guys like us that collect and Mm -hmm. you know that are really into this stuff sure we're going to do that but you know just your average guy that's into golfing and hunting and stuff you know he might want to play some atari but he doesn't want to go through all that he hold but atari flashback sure why not you know just hook it up to the new tv show something your kids that your kids used to play when they were little and um so yeah that's uh it's all good I'm, i'm fine with it and i like it when it's done well so yeah. And I think that's sort of the biggest thing. It needs to be done well, and it needs to be done, I think, for a good reason. I mean, I, I you know, am not against emulation myself. I have some systems that I have emulated right now. Um, but And I think part of it also is just those things, like you said, are getting so expensive mm-hmm. that you, your average person just can't get a hold of those things anymore. And if companies would make a, a, a super cheap easy way for them to get a hold of that stuff i think a lot of people would be very willing to do that yeah and i, I love when they do you know the i was you know the ps1 and ps2 era were great for you know these discs of you know arcade compilation discs that was really a, a fun time for uh you know for the mid 90s when namco put it puts out the museums and stuff and then carries that over to ps2 and it was a great time to be able to play you know arcade perfect games at home on your console and then they kind of with the Nintendo shop channel and everything they kind of went away from that where you had to buy each game individually so it got a little more expensive to do mm-hmm. that and, yeah but there was a few you know there's a data east collection on the Wii that's really good and, and you know th- things like the uh, the NES classic and the Super Nintendo classic are good ways for Nintendo to, to keep their history alive I absolutely just, I, I don't know that they went far enough with that system I think you know what would have been nice, I think at least, um, is if they had made that s- some way for players to be able to expand that library in some way. Yeah, if they sold additional titles for a couple of bucks a piece or something that you could download or whatever, or they had firmware updates or whatever, you know, some some way to mm-hmm. you know add to it. And you know, of course, us hard you know hardcore guys are are modding them so they can do it themselves. Oh yeah, absolutely. So. But yeah, so it would have been nice if the companies would would do that. 
All right, well, Ethan, do you have anything for him? <sighs> kind, kind of, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, how about this? Um, so just to give you guys an example of one of the stories in here, you mind if I just read one? Sure. So there's, okay, so Mario Paint, right? Popular okay. game for the Super Nintendo. Kiddos like to play it. Well, did you know it was actually a very violent game? You may not know that. Unless, okay, so John Riggs is a pretty popular YouTuber, and he wrote a story uh, about Mario Paint. So just real quick. So this is John Riggs. He says, I thought Mortal Kombat was the most violent video game I would ever play. That was before my friends and I got a hold of Mario Paint. I'm not sure what drew me to the game, but I knew I had to have it the moment I heard about it. In the 80s, when I wasn't making flipbook animations, I had something called an Etch-A-Sketch Animator 2000, where you could animate a short story in pixel form. With Mario Paint, I was a little disappointed that you could only animate relatively few frames at a time. Still, thinking how creative, uh, creative I could get under these limitations, I decided to draw Link chopping with an axe with a blood spurt as the axe landed on the final frame on whatever it was cutting. I animated him chopping random objects from a human head to a pile of cats. To make it funnier, the soundtrack I provided was a happy tune that featured cats meowing. My friends and I were rolling on the floor, laughing at our masterful creation. The creativity was endless. I shudder to think what other people animated behind closed doors. <laughs> so that's just just one little example of one of the shorter, uh, what I call insider insides, just stories of what people did. With it. There's all kinds of stuff through here of, of just you know, amusing stuff and just all, you know, different age groups. You know, some people playing, discovering these games as adults, some growing up with them, runs the full gamut. Anyhow, that's just kind of a, one small example of uh, the kind of stories you're talking about. All right. Well, if people are interested in checking out the book, where can they find it? Well, uh, like I said before, so Amazon, CNES Omnibus, you can just get it direct through Amazon, or if you want a signed copy, with extras, I'll throw in a copy of Old School Gamer Magazine number five. That's the latest issue. And I'll throw in some other extras, like some signed trading cards and some bookmarks and things. Uh, you can go to brettweisswords.com, B R E T T W E I S S words.com. That's got links to all the books, my Twitter, Facebook, and all that good stuff. So just brettweisswords.com, and you can order direct. All right. Well, Ethan, last chance to get anything in there. I've my mind has been blown by the uh, link animation of cats now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no telling what people came did with that. <laughs> I, that I, game. I bet if we scoured YouTube for crazy Mario Paint animations, you could find some insane stuff. Right. Well, that's one thing about my books that people have have talked about. They said, you know, reading your books and all, you know, there's obscure titles along with the popular ones. It's gotten me to want to learn more about those games. So they might mm -hmm. read a chapter about a game and then pursue it further, either buy it on eBay or just read more about it or watch videos of it. So Books Connects is a good act as a good, you know, starting point too to to investigate the games further. All right. Well, there you go. That is going to be it uh, for our conversation with Brett Weiss. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Oh, you bet. Thank you, guys. I really enjoyed it i appreciate it and again if anybody wants to find you the website again just brettweisswords.com b-r-e-t-t-w-e-i-s-s words.com all right well thank you very much again for joining us this week it's been a pleasure yeah thanks a lot y'all have a good one you too uh that will be the show this week so thank you ethan for being on the show I am going to go take some medicine for my tooth. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. If you want to reach out to us, we have tons of new ways to do so. You can email us at uh, podcast at prosgent.com. That's P-R-O-C-G-E-N-T dot com. You can send us a voicemail if you want by clicking on the voicemail link on the right side of the website. You can send us voicemails up to 90 seconds in length, and we'll play those on future episodes of the show and respond to the questions that you have. Uh, if you like what we do here, you can now support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash pgint. 
Patreon supporters will get a video version of the podcast a day early. These will normally go out on Tuesdays. Patreon supporters will get them on Monday. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash progenint. Check out our YouTube channel that we've got and see the content we've got going on up there. And then we still do have the Facebook group where you can interact with us on a daily basis as well.